Hey. Hey. Hi, guys. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right. So we just hit one o'clock and we might get going and other people will show up and, you know, sometimes people do need to drop as we go, but um, we will manage it. So this is Share What You Know Masterclass in uh, IP and branding in collaboration with Neutromic session number three, particularly focused on licensing IP. And it's going to be hosted by Rosie, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, for those that don't know Rosie, she works with Neutromix as dedicated legal counsel. I'm ruining her title now, but she's got, this is her, <laughs> this is her jam, the whole space of uh, IP patents, branding and setting yourself up and all those things that some people find um, super gloss overy are but remarkably important. This is what we've been focusing on for the past. Uh, we've had two other sessions and we've got two more after this. So Without further ado, I will hand over to Rosie. Actually, for Rosie's benefit and for anyone else that might not be familiar too, maybe we just go around quickly and introduce since we've got a only a handful here in the room live. Well, that's a decent. So we've got maybe, Beck, did you just want to give a quick introduction of yourself and maybe give some context around these types of topics about why it might be interesting to you or, or relevant or what you, might, what you might be looking to get out of this session? Um, hey, yeah, I'm Beck. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders of Extitu. So we've um, web-based, um, cloud-based software that helps people um, express their values in a way that's um, clinically and legally relevant um, and sort of feeds into all aged care systems, but healthcare and all kinds of stuff. Um, and we really believe that collaboration is the best way forward um, and always keen to hear perspectives on how different ways of structuring that legally um, so that I think that it's always a good to approach these things open-minded so I like to understand how people approach it. Cool, thank you. Stephen. Thanks Pete. Um, uh, I'm a founder of My Health Match. Um, I work with Allied Health in the within the Allied Health, te health tech space particularly around Allied, um, sorry, patient engagement. Uh, I've been joining these because the in that startup phase, just trying to work out which ducks to get in what row and what size ducks they are and who's got a bigger duck that's going to potentially steal my duck. So <laughs> <laughs> it's been really interesting uh, and somewhat terrifying in the last two sessions, but I'm bracing for the, the last three. There's some big ducks to look at. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, Adam Waddell over to you. Uh, look, it would be it would be remiss to me not to say this. Adam Waddell, Provisio, uh, probably a duck handler would would put that <laughs> into context. Um, so I play with all different sizes of ducks, and basically, rather than put them in one row, um, I'm really help, out there helping organisations basically to to navigate this as well. So similar to Steve, but probably from a, a slightly different perspective. I'm actually curious about how. Uh, this is seen amongst a multitude of organisations and how you all sort of interact with this. So, uh, you know, it, it's always interesting to give that cross-section. Awesome. And Frayne? Unmute. Hi. Uh, good to meet everyone. Um, I'm Frayne. I'm CEO of Well Revolution. We're based in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, we're a primary care platform um, that helps clinical practices shift to digital. Um, so what basically we are is a um, is an app that people use to um, get online or offline access to their doctors. Um, I'm interested um, in this space um, primarily around licensing um, IP or the legal structures around licensing IP. The acquisition side is also interesting. Um, I don't have any particular use cases for it yet, um, but I'm just interested to learn. Nice one. And for those who don't know Alex, you can say hi. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm the Ops Manager of Talking Health Tech. I'm um, interested in this session because I've had fun organising it with Roy and Rosie and everyone else. Um, and also just keen from a, you know, personally, I'm curious about the whole process too. So that's me. Nice one. Before we hand over to Rosie as well, Roy, for, because you're the last one here, say hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, Roy. I work with Rosie at Neutromics. Um, I have to organize the sessions and also personally, I'm trying to like learn more about the IP space and kind of get a hang on things as I'm 
probably new to the whole med tech field and as well as IP. So yeah, keen to learn more. Love it. Okay, so Rose, I'm going to hand over to you. I'll go on mute, but by all means, it's a collaborative thing, guys. So there's the chat going on, but if you do want to jump in with a question, you're welcome to. That's why we did it as a meeting as opposed to a webinar. So uh, over to you, Rosie. Thanks, Paige. Um, so I'm Rosie. I'm a qualified patent attorney. So I'm not a lawyer, which is really the domain of IP licensing. Um, but today I just want to take you through, you know, generally what I know and what I've learned being with Nutromix and talking to other people. I'm just going to share the slides. Um, please do feel free to jump in with any questions along the way. Um, I may not cover exactly what you want to know, but um, you can also reach out to me afterwards um, with your specific questions. I am an in-house IP attorney, so I'm not biased. And so as long as there's no conflict of interest, I'm happy to answer questions and again. Um, so look, it might be a bit of a general, um, or look like a general talk and it pretty much is. So I do encourage questions and um, yeah, to get the most out of this. So I'm just gonna cover what is an IP license kinds of IP licenses, typical terms in an IP license and what can be negotiated, usually um, payments to the licensor by the licensee and due diligence. So what is an IP license? Um, it's an agreement between an IP rights owner, the licensor, and a party who was given authority to use those IP rights, which is the licensee. Um, it's usually in exchange for monetary value in the form of license fees and royalties. It could be other things as well, and I'll go through that when we get to the payments page. Um, the parties agree on the terms and conditions via negotiation. Some people will have approached me and said, oh, I've got this document, you know, I don't like it, I'll have to sign it. And I'm like, no, everything's negotiable. It just depends on whether you win the negotiation or not. So um, they are negotiable negotiable. A lot of places have template um, documentation. So, you know, but they can be bespoke to your situation if you um, want to do that. Um, the licensor remains the owner of the licensed IP rights and um, it is reliant on the licensee's ability to effectively commercialise the IP rights in most circumstances. So um, that's one of the benefits of licensing but one of the downfalls for the licensor. Um, and an IP license, I'm familiar with patents. So my IP licenses are related to patents, but you can actually have licenses that cover patents and design rights and related know-how, trademark rights, copyright, um, trade secrets and confidential information. So it covers, you know, one and all. Um, usually with patents, there is related know-how or they could, you know, or could be trade secrets. Um, it's very important and it's part of the due diligence page I'll go into is, is having a look at, you know, when it says, you know, patterns and related know-how, that that know-how is properly defined and then that actually is know-how that you can use. So kinds of IP licenses, um, there's three primary kinds. Um, there's the exclusive license, and this gives the licensee the exclusive right to use the IP rights and prevents even the licensor from using those IP rights while the license is in effect. So if you're the licensee in that situation, it's all yours. Um, then you have sole license, and this gives the licensor the right to continue to use the IP rights, but prevents it from granting licenses to other licensees while the license is in effect. So it's you and the licensor, but no one else. And then we have the non-exclusive license, and that gives the licensee the right to use the IP rights without exclusivity and allows the licensor to grant any number of licenses. Um, sometimes in those sort of non-exclusive arrangements, um, they may have a limit defined in the license, such as, you know, there'll be only three, a limit of three non-exclusive licenses. You know, you can um, have those put into the agreement. So, you know, you know, is it just gonna be me and 10 others? Then I'm gonna compete with everybody. Because usually, you know, if you're all using the same IP rights, you can't sort of attack each other and it's 
sort of reduces the competitive um, the competitive nature of things. But you know, the licensor might like that situation because it gives them more opportunity for their IP to be commercialised. So. Typical terms in an, in an IP licence, and I said at the start in the contents page that any one of these terms is negotiable. Whether you want to negotiate, it makes it is, is a different story. It depends on your, you know, your particular circumstances. But you know, even the first thing I've got there, which is the effective date. So that's the date the agreement comes into effect. It might not necessarily be the day that both parties have executed the agreement. You could agree on a date that. Um, and the reason you might do that is because most things, um, most of the um, deadlines and payment terms and things like that might come and be calculated from that date. So they might have, we'll talk about the fees later, but there might be a fee that's due in six months from the effective date. You might change the effective date or you might change the date that that payment's due and ask for an extension up front because you know um, you want to put it into your budget. Um, one of the, um, in, another important term is the field of use. Um, it may be all fields, so that's where the IP writes. It's for all fields that that IP could possibly use. Or it can be a statement that positively defines the fields of use um, that the licensee is granted to practice um, for that IP or a negatively defined field um, of use um, from which the licensee is excluded to practice the IP. So it might be, you know, medical devices excluding a patch so it's every other medical device but not the patch and the reason they might do that is that the licensor could be still working on that part or they've already licensed that part to someone else and so you have these defined fields and you have to be very careful that where you tread with your development and use of that licensed IP and a lot of these terms come into play depending on the type of license um, that I just mentioned those three before the term of an IP licence, um, it's usually for a fixed term, but not exceeding the life of the IP rights granted, because you can't have a licence where you're required to pay fees and that you're trapped into when there's, you know, you're not getting any benefit from it. So it usually, you know, has a fixed term, but or, or you know, the last known valid right of, of the IP that's in there. As I said, I'm familiar with patents, so it's usually, you know, when the last patent is standing. Um, but sometimes if there is a fixed term or well, there won't be a fixed term if there's an indefinite lifespan and, and trademarks are continually renewable for generally 10 year periods and trade secrets don't have an end of life. Um, but they might have terms where it's like five years renewable for another five years, renewable for another five years. Um, and that might be in there as well. Then we have the territory. It may be worldwide, but of course, these if it is that, the license can only extend where the IP rights exist. So it's just a simple way of putting it rather than going, oh, you've got patents in three countries, I'll just write blah, blah, blah. They just go worldwide because you don't know where it might go from there and what else might be in there. And of course, things like trade secrets and confidential information don't have a geography, so it probably would be worldwide. Um, and sometimes you can be restricted to certain specific geographical areas. Um, I've never really had that imposed on me, but it's something that can be done and it probably would be, to, um, you know, maybe the licensor wants to carve out the, the territory that certain companies can, can exploit in. A license agreement will always, just like any other type of, or well, most types of agreements, have confidentiality clauses and provisions and that's you know setting out what what information can be exchanged and on the terms and conditions of that confidential obligations um, regarding that information and that clause will survive um, the IP license um, usually for a period of time and depending on that nature that confidentiality may be forever so um, that's in there. Hey Rosie, I saw in the chat, Rebecca's asked, are you able to give some general examples of the types of situations when people would use an IP license as opposed to say a distribution license or something else? Okay, so I could just remember, I do preface with this with the, um, I'm not a, a, a legal person, I'm a patent attorney, but I would say that an, an IP license is where you're gonna take the IP rights 
and keep continue to develop them or use them to, to protect the, what you're what you're going to put on the market. So I'm a patent attorney. So if I've I've got a patent that covers a device, um, it may still need to be developed to get it to commercial stage. Um, I would want that IP license. I didn't create it; someone else did. I need that. I need those rights so that I can protect myself. I'm going to keep developing it, put it on the market. Um, so an IP license is to, to get the protection of IP rights um, and to put um, exploit IP rights. A distribution agreement, in my mind, is something where it's an agreement going, someone else has developed that device and I'm just going to distribute it and have the either exclusive, non-exclusive. I assume they come in different forms. Um, but it's just distribution, just you know, distribution rights of that product. So you're going to exclusively give it to me, you know, if it's a milk product, because that's um, I am familiar with that part of it, a milk product, and I get to distribute it to all the cafes in Melbourne. No one else is going to get that delivery run. So it's it's me. I'm going to get all that. So there, that that would be to me um, the two different the differences between those two types of agreements. Does that Oh, and I just want to add, maybe with that distribution agreement, there may be similar terms. I've never seen one, so I'm not a lawyer, as I said, but I assume there might be similar terms as an IP licence, like the geography, the field, um, the term and things like that. So they probably would have similarities. I have to keep moving my camera a bit down so I can read my slides. Um, so these are some more typical terms in an IP license. Um, so, and I've just wrapped them up because they can get a bit legalistic and whatnot, and they're not, you know, always the same. Um, and it does depend on the jurisdiction because sometimes there would be, you know, maybe legislation laws or court decisions that may affect the type of extent of these provisions um, as with any other agreement. Um, so representations, warranties and liabilities. So generally a licensor will only accept the risk for activities over which it has control. Um, they typically do not represent or warrant the validity of the licensed IP rights. That's really up to the licensee. You wanna you want license my IP rights? You know, you need to find out if they're, they're gonna be valid and you know, you don't have to do it at the time you sign the license, but you know, that's your, the responsibilities on you. Um, Typically, the licensee accepts responsibility for infringement of any third party IP rights. And that's typical because you're the one that's going to be exploiting it. And I say typical, it depends on if it's a, you know, non, if it's an exclusive license, if it's a, if it's a sole license, and the license source one doing the infringing, um, I don't think you would accept the responsibility as the licensee. I think you'd have something like each party would accept the responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also the license saw indemnifies for any loss caused by its acts and or emissions and any liabilities on the licensees of limit liability to do so. Just on that, um, again, this isn't my forte, but um, particularly in life science health tech licenses, from what I've seen, um, the license law is required to have certain public and product liability insurance as a condition of the grant, the license. So you have to go out and get that and produce your certificates and currency saying, you know, when I do my clinical trials, I'll, I'll be able to have insurance if something happens when my product goes on the market um, and it's used um, in the hospital, I've got, you know, I'm covered. Some licensee licensors will say, well, you need to cover me as well. And it's like, I have still found a lot um, insurance agency that's going to cover another party. So um, it's usually as long as you've got sufficient um, coverage, that should be fine. Um, so IP right specific clauses, um, I've wrapped them up here. So we have acknowledgement. So the parties acknowledge that the licensor's got exclusive rights to whatever the IP is, and the licensee agrees not to challenge those IP rights. Um, yeah, so even if you find that they're, you know, down the track, they're not, maybe not valid, you, you don't have the right to challenge them while you're under that license. Um, they usually um, have that in there because obviously while you're, you know, Got the license agreement you're going to find out whether those those claims are valid or um yeah so they put pop that in there i'm sure it happened back in the day before that that became a typical clause 
Then we have the ongoing costs and maintenance of IP. So the licensees usually required to reimburse the licensor for ongoing costs um, to keep, um, if there are ongoing costs, if the cases are pending and you still got to get them to grant and to maintain those IP rights if there's any costs there. Um, there's lots that you can negotiate. I, you know, you don't have control as the licensee, you don't have control what those costs are going to be. Depends on who the licensor engages. Um, I'm talking about patent costs. You can try and ask for a budget. Um, that would be my tip, which is what I've done. I've asked um, for budgets to be provided um, and deadlines so I can sort of know when things are going to come up. Um, they usually say, we choose who we want to use and you're, you just pretty much have to live with it. But as a licensee, um, and because of my network of um, attorneys around the world um, from you know, when I worked at my patent attorney firm, um, you know, I've I've negotiated to so that Neutromix is 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 consulted on who they might use and and what they might do, and you know, a lot of licensors might be amenable to that as well. Um, one thing I've noticed, and this is another thing to think about, if there is going to be multiple. Um, licensees or a licensee, a head licensee and a sub-licensee, usually these costs can be divided out. So you're not just bearing, you know, the grunt of everything because IP costs can be expensive. Then we have the IP improvements. So you're the licensee, you've been developing this technology that you've licensed. Um, it's not uncommon that, you know, you would, you would tell the licensor about what you've been doing. And I'll go into that because there's a reporting clause that's usually in there. Um, and if they've been doing further development, you know, you'll let each other know because everyone's trying to get a win-win situation um, from a license agreement. Um, and these are things that are typical, but as I said, they're all negotiable. So where the pattern, and I'm going to lean towards patents because that's my forte, where patent improvements are devised by the licensor and fall within claims of already licensed patents, you know, sometimes they just automatically, they'll just get swept up into, into that license agreement. You may have to do an addendum or an, or an amendment, but, you know, usually the licensor is not going to go, well, I'm going to go try and give these to someone else because then it might, you know, hinder your ability to exploit it already you're already licensed um, IP so they usually might get swept up but these are things to think about if you're going down the licensing route either as a licensor or, or as a licensee what would you do in those situations and 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 have it covered in your template because you will be given you know you don't want to start from scratch with these these documents they can be 30 pages long or longer but you need to know things you might need to think about um, if the improvements of the licensor are severable, that means like they're just not connected to what you've already had licensed. They, they might want you to enter a separate agreement or they might go like, try and license it elsewhere. So they aren't obligated to come to you. But the, the we've found that, you know, the more of a relationship you have with your licensor, um, the better it is because you can talk about these sorts of things. Um, where the improvements are devised by a licensee, um, I think the first position a licensor always takes is you improve my IP, you have to give it back to me or give me the rights to use it. Um, this happens in a lot of agreements. Um, I, you know, as a licensee, I say push back. It depends. It depends what those improvements might be. And, you know, if you've done something super spectacular that just wasn't obvious from what you've licensed, well, why should you have to give the rights back? But it's negotiable. Um, so, as I've said at the bottom there of the slide, um, it is possible for the licensee to own IP improvements. What's that, what does an IP improvement look like? Is that like, so you've taken the product and then putting it in a local market and then for some reason you've built up specific expertise or something? Um, it's more in the patent realm, Pete. It's more like, you know, the licensor has got this scope of protection and while I've been doing it, I figured out there's a better way of doing it. And I wouldn't have figured that out without that starting point. It might have taken me longer or whatever. It's sort of like I've built on their IP. Yeah. And they might go, well, you started with our IP, so you should, you know, we should own it. But, it, you know, you can get separate protection for improvements. It depends on, 
as I said, remember I spoke about novelty and obviousness, so it depends yeah. what that leap is. But if it's, you know, inventive and it's so right, you could apply for that and get your own IP rights. And it might be that these improvements mean that you don't really need those rights of that license anymore. And you might go, well, I've got my own rights now. I don't need yours because yours isn't good enough. Mine's, mm. mine's the better efficient way. So it's something that's built on what you've already got, I think is the best description I can yeah. come up with. Interesting. Okay. Mm. Um, and that's probably what the licensor actually can get concerned about is that I've given you this license and if you've built on it, well, you might not need me anymore. And then there goes my revenue stream. So, you know, they want to keep you tied in as much as possible. Not in a bad way, but that's the way it works. Uh, they go on these, these typical terms in a license. As I said, these documents can be pages and pages long. So um, assignability. So that's another one where um, whether the licensee has the right to assign the agreement without consent. So it's like, I'm the licensee, I might want to give it to Roy. Do Am I allowed to do that? Like, you know, and do I need to seek consent or without consent? And what circumstances would I need to have the consent of the licensor to do a transfer? Um, you know, if you're having a change of name, um, those sorts of things would hopefully be without consent. Otherwise, it's administratively burdensome. Um, but, you know, it's usually where, you know, the licensor want to want to make sure that they, you know, they're okay with who you're going to give it to, you know, because it's my, my it's my possession. I need to know it's going to be it's going to be looked after. Um, the next one's change of control, and that's sort of a bit different. It's um, this is a provision that's usually in, um, in it, particularly um, I found with startups. But it's like if you have a transfer sale, or you know, you know, be an IPO or even bankruptcy. Um, the license agreement will defer, define um, what occurrences will constitute a change of control of a party. And that could also be um, the license or but mainly it's the licensee and the consequences of the change of control taking place. Now, they like it that, you know, if you're gonna be making money as the licensee, I wanna be making money. So if you have a change of control where, you know, you sell your company for, $200 million, I want to cut about a 5%. And that might be in there. And these things are negotiable. But, um, you know, sometimes when you're a startup and you need, you need this license, you might not have much bargaining power, but you've just got to try and set the scenario and tell the story and see where you go. But it's one to watch out for. Um, sub-licensing, um, whether a licensee is permitted to grant sub-licenses and on what terms. And of course, that probably, you know, starts with what is the type of license that you have to start with, because um, in some instances, you might not be able to be, be able to grant sub licenses. And it should be noted, there are things like, if you're not performing or not, you know, meeting things that are in the license, the licensor might impose a sub license on you. So if you're not, you know, getting it there they'll they could come to you and go well i've got this party who could do better than you in this area i might need to grant them a sub license and sometimes you know again you'll have to go through a negotiating round then whether that's possible whether you know why you're not wanting to do that and things like that so um, another term um, in an ip license is performance or milestones these typically relate to development regulatory sales and commercialization um because the license or you know they've given you these rights as a licensee they want you to be doing something with it so they can start getting their money so they'll have fees they'll have you know royalty rates and we'll talk about those soon um but you know they want you know they're going to demand and say by this date i want this done this date i want this done yes they are negotiable but you need to know that you can't just gloss over those because if you don't meet them, one, you may have to pay an extension to meet that date, which is costing you money, or, you know, 
they can turn around and go, well, you're not doing what you said you, you know, what you need to do. I'm going to terminate your license because you're not, you know, you're not performing. I need to, I need to make money with someone else. So, you know, these are all interrelate and have consequences. So really need to look at that. Um, and these performance or milestones, they need to be really clear and, you know, avoid any ambiguity. Um, so, you know, best efforts to reach the market and reasonable endeavours, you know, to make that commercial product not good enough. So it could be, you know, you'll end up in court going, well, what, what's best effort? What's reasonable endeavours? And some countries actually don't like this sort of thing. So really good to make sure it's clear, you know, what does it mean? You know, even if you have to go prototype device, what is that in respect of what type of use um, is it? Is it going? You know, approval, regulatory approval for, from which country? Um, things like that. What type of regulatory approval? Um, things you know, really clear. Oops. Um, reporting. So I mentioned this before. Um, just in brief, but a licensee is usually required to keep records and books, which may be audited by a representative of the licensor, um, and to submit regular progress reports to the licensor. So these can be negotiated, but you know, usually big licensors that are used to licensing out their IP will have a set system in place, but they can be quarterly, half yearly, or annual. And you usually have to include things like your, you know, are you making any money and what are my royalties? Have you been paying me the right amount of royalties? Um, have you made any sub-license agreements and payments, other revenue? What key activities have you done? Have you raised, you know, money in, in a funding round or, you know, sold off stuff, built, built manufacturing plants, um, you know, and things like that. So they usually, I've seen in license agreements, there's, there's a template at the back, um, for these reporting so that does make it easier so you can get something to start with so um typically the next one rights to continue to conduct and publish research so a lot of people license ip from universities universities their main thing is education and research um they do develop IP, but not commercialise it. So they will say to you, yes, I'll licence this IP to you, but I want the rights to continue to conduct research and um, use it for educational purposes and publish any improvements. And you can't gloss over those as well because, you know, you don't want them publishing something that might be hindering your activities. Um, so there has to be a balance reached um, as to, to what goes on there. Um, and as I, I did briefly mentioned before, but termination. So provisions regarding how the agreement may be terminated by the licensee and the grounds upon which the licensor might terminate. And these are usually based on breaches, and um, lack of performance and things like that. So these are the main terms, the ones I've just gone through. There are others and not all of them will be in there. And I'll, I'll, they could be in any different shape or form, but it's just good to have an idea and really try to understand what, what, what they cover, how they interplay um, when you're on either side of the table, really. <clears throat> um, payments. So, of course, if someone's going to grant you the right to use it, they usually will want something in return. It's not necessarily, you know, most time it's money but there could be other things as well or a combination of things. So the first one is usually a licence fee, an initial upfront payment as part as soon as you sign on with the licence. So, you know, within six months of the effective date, you need to pay me $10,000. Yep, okay, they'll send you an invoice and you'll have to pay. Sometimes um, it can say in there that that, pay, that fee, and I'm talking about patents here because but it could be with any IP, that, you know, that $10,000 may be credit, credited towards royalties that might be if, if they're going to become due or other payments that are due, such as prior IP costs incurred by the licensor. So the licensor might have done, file, you know, prepared a uh, patent application, had it filed, it gone through a bit of the process. They keep a nice record that I've spent $14,000 you're going to have to pay those costs when, if you take up this license. You have to pay me the ten thousand, but you know what? I'll deduct the ten thousand from the fourteen, and you, 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 you know, you won't have to owe me twenty four. You'll just have to owe me fourteen. Um, I love it when they say maybe credited. 
I always want it to be, will be credited. It will happen. It's not discretionary. Um, I try and look for those little words like that. I'm not legal, but I'm legal enough to go. I like, you know, things to be definite. Um, and I like to know what the prior IP costs might be. They should be able to tell you if they're going to charge you that. You need to know because you might have that big sign on fee and go, yeah, I can afford $10,000. And then you've got these prior IP costs of another $14,000. Um, it's a hefty bill to have very quickly. Um, performance on milestone payments. And these can vary and are negotiable, but there are some sort of stock standard ones that people adopt. Um, and, and their performance on trying to, you know, make sure that you're actually doing what you, you need to do to make, um, you know, commercialise the product and get that revenue stream going for yourself, but for the licence or. Um, so these can relate to manufacturing a working prototype, um, the licensee granting a sub-licence to operate in a particular jurisdiction. Um, they, you know, the license on my go, well, you have to pay me every time a patent's granted or an IP rights granted because it gives you stronger protection or it's going to boost your position in the market. Um, the first sale of a product, completion of, you know, animal or human studies, um, obtaining regulatory approval, fulfilling the market demand, whatever that may mean, that's a bit ambiguous. But, you know, these are set out and it's usually, you know, um, they'll, they'll want something license all have an idea in their head of you know if you're doing all this stuff you're obviously going to you know commercialize a product and create a revenue stream so i'm sort of like coaxing you along to go i need this sort of stuff done and that could be years away but you need to um map out any if you're the licensee which i am in in, in some cases and maybe the license or in the future but you know map out the things that you need to be doing and, and the dates that you need to be meeting because they're not going to send you a nice reminder going you know in a year's time we want you to manufacture that working prototype that was in our license agreement just so i remind you it's your responsibility as a licensee um and these payments once you meet these milestones or performances they're typically not credited anywhere so um so yeah, their payments, no refund, that's it. And as I, I think I briefly mentioned before, sometimes if there's a deadline, you haven't met it, you may need to pay a fee to have that extended by six months. And of course you have to make the judgment call if you haven't even started working on your prototype and the deadline's up and you've only got another six months, you know, you're just not gonna make it. You might be paying lots of fees to get there and you have to really consider whether you're doing enough to meet the requirements of this, of this license. Oh, there's a three in the chat, so I just noticed it. I can I see Pierre has asked a question about um, IP generated by artificial intelligence more generally, a question as opposed to one thing about the slides. And if you've got any, <clears throat> you want that one in particular. Okay. I'm not a chemist, so but I did read um, AI, lovely Australian courts. Yes, they can be an inventor. Um, but in the US, it was no, there is a slight difference in the way the legislation is worded. I don't know what's happening around the world. I haven't quite kept up with it. But I know the Commissioner of Australian Patents has um, appealed that decision. And I'm fingers crossed. I think it was a silly decision. I can say that. But um, I think it needs to be a person, a real person. But that's my opinion. Um, so I would say if you want to know more about that, I would Google around. There's some people doing some nice articles about the AI and staying in touch with that. Um, and it's a watch this space. Um, eh, could an Australian company license its IP to an overseas licensee if an AI is on their pattern? I assume so. It, you know, if, if I assume with that, that there must be know-how or trade secrets, you know, because that AI, that artificial intelligence might come into play with how to best, best use or exploit that pattern. So if, you know, Australia gets to keep its um, that decision holds against the appeal that an AI, artificial intelligence can be named as an inventor and that pattern's considered valid from that perspective, yeah, you could license it, but I assume you may need more and I would be, you know, one part of the due diligence is um, checking the status of your patent and, you know, 
you've got it all um, and understand it all. One thing I'd like to make sure is that, you know, IP ownership's, in, you know, correct and, and being determined. So I don't know if that answers your question completely, but I believe it could. Um, but you would have to make sure, are you getting all the IP you need to exploit that invention? Okay, the big one that people ask me about with payments, royalties. Um, it's an agreed percentage of returns from, from commercialising the IP rights, usually expressed as a percentage of sale price or net sales. It could be a lot of other things of a licensed product or method. Um, it's not like something you can look up and go, that's what it's going to be. This is something that you're going to have to, you'll be given it by the licensor. You need to work out how it works. I'm still not completely across it, but I get it. Um, it's something I had to learn in the last year very quickly. Um, and, you know, work out whether it works for you. So you, if it's a you know, net sales or a sale price, you have to work out what's going to be the price of your product or the service. If I have to then deduct, you know, 5%, whatever percent it may be to pay my license or how much is that going to leave me? Am I going to make a profit? Am I going to make enough of a profit? All that sort of thing. So it takes, yeah, it's like a calculating thing. Accountant, you know, legal people, everybody gets involved. And it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. But things um, to watch out for, they do have, you know, it's this price, but these are the deductions. So the taxes get deducted, duties get deducted, freight and insurance costs. Think about the things that really add to the cost but aren't actually part of the whole manufacturing and sale price. So the normal things that would get deducted because you're not going to pay, you know, that shouldn't be part of that percentage. Um, in addition to that, so that usually starts from if it's a sale or net sales, these royalties are called earned royalties. So um, it's when you've started earning them, you'll start to pay these. But that, not, that might not be for, you know, five to seven years. So what these agreements have in there is the agreement may specify, well, I know that it's likely going to be seven years, but from the, you know, from year three, I want you to start paying me a minimum. It's a minimum minimum annual royalty payment and they'll be credited towards some royalty payment, whether that's royalties in that year or, you know, when you go to actually earn them. Usually it's for the same calendar year and if you, you know, it's you only get that benefit once because you paid a minimum and you started sales in that one year. Otherwise, it's just, you know, it's an ongoing payment. You know, the licensor wants a revenue stream and they've got to get it somehow. The other fun thing to look out for is um, stacking or anti-stacking provisions. So this allows a licensee to deduct all or some of the royalties or license fees payable um, to bring a product to market. So my understanding of it, and I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, you might have multiple license agreements. You'd have to get, you know, one from A party, one from B party, one from C. You don't want to have to be paying royalties out to everybody, you'll end up, you know, selling something for $20 and $5 here, there and everywhere, and you've got no profits left. So, you know, they have these anti-stacking um, provisions or, you know, where it's like if you have another license from someone else or each time you've got a separate license, you know, we'll reduce, you know, the percentage by blah, blah to a minimum amount of this. So you're not paying 5% to three different parties. You might be just paying, you know, 3% to each of them. So instead of 15, it becomes nine. So, you know, they don't want, they, they want you to know, make money as a licensee and to keep going. Otherwise, you know, the licensors will miss out as well. So it's complicated. It's not for the faint hearted to calculate, um, but very interesting um, seeing how it is and very negotiable. And you really, you know, we go to due diligence, but throughout this whole thing, you really have to think about the now and the future from both sides um, and, and really look at that to see, you know, whether you can make things work. Um, another thing that I found interesting um, when, now that I've joined the startup world, um, and I haven't seen this in play, but um, 
equity in exchange for granting rights to use its IP rights, um, particularly relevant for startups. So we know startups may at times not have enough money. So, you know, they might, you know, someone might, the licensor might go, well, I reckon you can do this. I'll give you these rights, but, you know, in a year's time, you have to give me 20% of your company or something like that. So, you know, you have to think of the consequences and think whether that's good for you. Um, so, you know, whether the license or takes ownership and whether that's going to be a good thing for the company or not. Um, there's also what they call an exit fee provision whereby the licensee promises the license or a small share of the proceeds. So that's sort of like what I mentioned before about that change of control. So, you know, if you're making lots of money on an IPO, you might have to pay that to, to exit out or because you're no longer going to be the licensee, um, it's gone to someone else with the public offering. So, um, yeah, and there's sometimes as well, you know, it might be that if you're offering blah, 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 you'll give it to the license or a discounted price. So, yeah, you have to, you know, remember these clauses exist in your license agreement because, you know, you might go, oh, I'm doing this deal with party X and, you know, you start doing it and then the license all gets wind of it and goes, well, you know, you just, you know, opened up provision X, Y and Z, so you now have to give me something. So, these are the things, they're like the Bible that you, and no offence to the religious reference, but it's sort of the thing that you have to keep going back to, like your shareholders D, you know, and remember those 40 pages in detail. Um, other forms of compensation, so provisions for research contracts, um, particularly universities, so I'll give you my IP rights, but, you know, if you need work done, you've got to, you know, come back to my university and have those experiments done here and, um, have paid this a minimum amount, blah, blah, blah. So that happens a few times. Um, and, you know, it's not that bad because they want to keep their researchers up to date and see what you're doing. And if you have a good relationship, why not? So that's something else that comes into play. And these sort of payments are, you know, one, one or the other, but usually a mixture of all of them. Okay, this is the last slide. So, and I'm coming to a close, but, you know, do, do you think about any questions you may have? So this is really light on, but yeah, due diligence. Um, that's when you, you know, the licensee needs to, you know, do some checking, um, take off the rose colored glasses and sort of, you know, IP rights, you know, you got to do some checking, you know, what's the status? Are they valid? Are they, you know, subject to any challenge? Will they be infringed third party rights if you're going to exploit them? You know, do they give you the protection you need? You might not end up having the answers to this at the time, but at some point you're going to have to check and go back. Um, you really want to make sure the status that they're actually, you know, do exist um, and what's really covered. And you can ask the license sort of producer this. It's all part of, I suppose, quote I'm going to say discovery I'm not a lawyer but you know I'm sure you know if a licensor is not giving you certain information that you have to be a bit concerned that you know they're not being honest from the start so um, but you do it's your responsibility you're going to be you know licensing these IP rights you need to know what you're getting you need to think about is it going to be sufficient for what you want to do now and into the future so you know do you still need to get some more protection um, What's the arrangement if more developments come into play by that license or, uh, you know, do you have the first right, you know, what do you need to do to develop that relationship so you do, um, you don't want to sort of be stuck, you know, with what you've got um, and then not getting the new stuff that's coming along. Um, and you really need to think about whether you've got your own capabilities to meet, you know, the performance and milestones, whether you're going to have the money, um, you know, it's a planning, planning exercise. And you, you don't have a crystal ball, but you've got to think about, you know, what's your game plan, you know, give it a go, you know, push the boundaries, but, you know, be realistic at the same time. Um, and as a licensor, you should make sure that your licensees, you know, are not going to go bankrupt or something else is going to happen. What's their status? Do they have the capabilities to meet your performance and milestones? And, you know, have they got the money to, to pay you? Um, you know, what, where are they? So in the end, you, you know, if you can work out the best relationship you can between licensor and licensee, that's your best bet. Um, keep the dialogue going, um, develop that relationship, 
it's great. Um, but yeah, and you noticed I didn't talk much about acquisition because um, I went too far with the licensing, but I'll try and wrap that up when I do the IP strategy. That's it, P. Nice one, thank you. Um, let's put it back in this view here. So I've got a, got a couple more minutes for any questions that people might have. I can see Rebecca put in the chat about 10 minutes ago asking about how IP ownership is determined or verified. Um, good question. I'm a patent team, so I'm going to talk about patents. But, you know, IP patent starts with the inventor, um, so did the licensor, you know, do an inventorship analysis, um, an ownership analysis? Um, there's certain criteria with the, with the inventor, you know, did they contribute to the invention? Did they, you know, do this, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you work out that as a first step. Then you might go, well, who do these people work for? What agreements do they have in place? But ultimately, who was named as the owner of that IP, right? And were those agreements correct, you know? Was it through an employment? Was it, you know, just Joe Bloggs who walked into the lab, didn't have an agreement signed and, and they've just put him on there and there's no actually, you know, line that goes to the IP owner. So it depends on the IP that we're talking about, um, but there are ways to determine it. Um, and this, you know, you look at the legislation, what's required for that to occur and, you know, did they do an analysis? And of course, my analysis, as with everything in legal, there's a, there could always be, a, you know, the other side to the coin that someone goes, well, actually, you know, I don't agree with that because that agreement didn't give you that right to, you know, acquire those rights from that employee or that wasn't, you know, the employee didn't do it in their course of their duties. So there's no set formula that you, well, not formula, but there's no set criteria and there's no way to, you know, get it rubber stamped and say, I've done it, it's correct. Um, it's just an analysis is done, but something that you should look at. Now, the next one, the next um, share what you know is IP strategy, I think. Um, good to send your questions in early if you can. It helps me trying to work out sort of how to formulate the um, presentation just so that you get the most out of it. But as I said, you're always welcome to reach out to me any other time. Which one? So yes. Rosie, look. I, unless there's any other questions, last chance for anyone else. Oh, great. There is one question about how to get in touch with Rosie. Okay, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, if you can find my name, just look me up on LinkedIn. Um, I'm at Nutromics. If you can't, my name is long, Stramandinoli. But um, yeah, I assume I'm in the community somewhere. You are. I think it might even be, so. yeah. You'll get my name from the slides or the you know the thing, and then reach out to me. Oh, thanks, Roy. That's <laughs> me. Um, send me a message there um, or call me. Once we're in contact, you'll get my number. I don't mind. Nice. Yeah, happy to help the community. Love it. All right. Well, thanks, guys. If that's uh, that's, all. that's all, we'll drop off, and you have a good rest of the day. Thank you again, Rosie. Thanks, no, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.